On today's episode, Liz and I welcome back to the show, Jeff Fort. We have a great chat about everything from parenting and relationship stress to 10 second hugs and intentionally making the most of every interaction with your spouse or partner. Jeff Fort is a relationship expert and author of the books, The 90 Minute Marriage Miracle and Be Happy Forever. Jeff has experienced both a divorce and the death of his second wife. You can find Jeff on Facebook at Peak Results Coaching, and his website is 90MinuteMarriageMiracle.com. That's 90MinuteMarriageMiracle.com. We hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to Stronger Marriage Connection. I'm psychologist Liz Hale, along with this esteemed professor, Dr. Dave Schramm. Together, we are dedicating our life's work to bringing you the best we have in valid marital research, along with a few tips and tools to help you create the marriage of your dreams. Well, today we have back by popular demand, my friend, colleague, Jeff Fort. He's got an amazing background of helping not only those in the corporate world, but now also those in the family world as well. It's interesting how many similarities there are between the two. He's here to help us about his impact on healthy marriages, one individual partner at a time. We're also going to be enlightened by other crucial topics that have crossed Jeff's desk and heart lately. So again, we're really so pleased to have him back. Welcome back to Stronger Marriage Connection, Jeff. Yeah, thank you, Liz and Dave. I'm very excited to be back. As are we to have you. As an expert on marriage and family systems and also the working systems, my friend, you mentioned that on the forefront of your mind is the state of our nation, the human race. I mean, right before our eyes, we're seeking the unraveling of values and morals, a loss of integrity. They all make a tremendous impact regarding the conditioning of our most vulnerable younger generation, which I know you have studied. You have had, had some interesting background in. What are the specific circumstances that are ringing this alarm bell for you? Well, I have a, I have a teenage son, so I'm very much uh, tuned into the younger mindset, what they're watching, what they're paying attention to. And you know, if you were to ask the question, what are the values that society holds in highest regard? Years ago, you might hear things like integrity, honesty, openness, trust, trustworthiness. And today, it doesn't take really much thought to see lots of deceit, lies. You're not sure what the truth is. And when we look for role models, who, who do you trust implicitly? Who can you trust completely? Um, there's a wavering of who might that be? I don't know. Is, is, it, is it apparent to anybody? What are the role models for men? What are the role models like for women? And when you take into account the deterioration of values in young people on social media, promiscuity is on the rise. Uh, I, I saw this... Um, video that led me into a rabbit hole of more videos of interviews of women on the streets outside of clubs and so on and admitting they cheated on their boyfriends admitting they cheated on their husbands admitting they were sleeping with multiple partners at the same time and hearing um what they term as body count sexual partners of two or three hundred by age 23. and i, I, heard, my, body, I heard that term body count recently body count, sexual I part believe it yeah and so, I heard it. I heard. I'm sorry, but I heard it from a 14 year old. Yeah. And so this is a big deal. And um, one of the things that connected me with all of this is many years ago, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I, I came to the conclusion working with lots of women in relationships that the more sexual partners a woman had, this is just my own experience and observation, the more sexual partners a woman had, the more unhappy she was as she got older. And I remember distinctly an attorney who was a client of mine, had just been divorced for the third time and was telling me she could attract any man and she was single and loving it, loving it and uh, no man was unavailable to her. And I said to her, but can you keep them? And she immediately burst into tears. And so this leading with sex was not providing her with anything of value long-term. And today we go from 
there's a there's an epidemic of loneliness, as you know. But if you're a single woman and you're alone, you're empowered and you're independent. But if you're a man, you're just lonely. And so we kind of have this chasm in how society views single women who are alone and or or how the direction is going. Anyway, that's that's kind of what led me into this thinking of, and watching the, you know, from the gangs taking over stores and you know, no consequences and robbing CBS or Walmart or Targets or a jewelry store, whatever it happens to be. And so when there's no consequences and there's no public opinion about what societal norms are anymore, what we see is kind of the degradation of society. Very, what looks like low level things, but in the scheme of things, uh, they're they're quite profound. Yeah. Oh my goodness! Let's just talk about the word body count for a minute. I mean, when do we typically use body count, right? Well, we're counting dead bodies, right, mm-hmm. after a catastrophe. Mm-hmm. But for our younger generation to be using it as who they've made out with, I don't I don't know from A to Z exactly what that's included. But that's heartbreaking to me. And I was on a radio show here locally, and the last conversation we had was something about the more experience you have as young people, so the more people you sleep with, live with, et cetera, just like you were saying, Jeff, um, well, actually, the higher the divorce rate, right? So maybe that does have to do with unhappiness. That experience, after all, does not seem to be the answer when it comes to love, commitment, and marriage. It's just the opposite. That's right. And adding that, Already we have, if I remember correctly, according to a Gallup poll I saw, we have about 37% of women age 18, I think it's to 54, who have been clinically diagnosed as depressed, 37. And so what does that, what is that trending in 10 years, in 15 years? And so these are the types of things that, you know, are kind of preoccupying me based on the challenges that I see in the youth today. Well, just a side note, last side note, Dave and, and Jeff, is when I said that on the radio show, they haven't, they haven't had me back. <laughs> and I said, too much experience is not a good thing. I, I haven't had any calls lately from that station. Oh, that's funny. Jeff, you're, you're right, though. I, I, we have a teenage um, son as well, and it feels like, you know, this society with the morals, the values, and things just plummeting right now, it seems that parents are needed even more right now to fill in the gaps that at one time they could rely on their, on their communities or, you know, friends in this, this larger society uh, really to help them and to support them as, as parents. What what do you think are the, the dangers, I guess, that, that we as parents most need to, to wake up to and how can we make the greatest impact uh, on our children right now? Well, the, there's some pretty clear evidence that uh, there's studies done on what they call disadvantaged children. And disadvantaged children is a category that is is designated for single moms raising kids. And what we do know, and I'm going to read these stats because I don't want to screw them up. If you're a child of a single mom, you're five times more likely to commit suicide in contrast to a single dad or in contrast to a couple. Having a single dad seems to have the same outcome as a couple. So if you're with a single mom, you're nine times more likely to drop out of school, 10 times, 10 times more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol, and 20 times more likely to be in prison. So this trend towards single moms is also having an impact on society. And on a personal note, I remember um, there, there's a lot of self-centeredness that goes on in society today. And um, I remember uh, a couple of years ago, I entered the dating market and I started seeing a woman and I immediately became aware that my son's grades were slipping ever so slightly. And he seemed a little bit more distracted, more on his phone, a little bit less focused because I wasn't around as frequently as he was used to me being around. And so I decided that my priority was his well-being and I better get out of the dating market and become a full-time, completely focused parent. And so I did and his grades perked back up and everything went fine and he's a high honor student. And, but, but my, I view my role as a parent as kind of a sacred duty. And so the most important thing that I can do in my life today is to become a reasonably good role model for him. And, and for me, even that's a work in progress. I'm certainly not perfect, 
I try to be a little better over time, try to be more present and in tune with how he's feeling, trying to have conversations when a rebellious teen doesn't really want to talk to you. You know how that can go. And so there are periods of time where he just is unwilling to open up about how he's feeling, how he's doing. And I, and I accept that and I don't try to pry, but I do continue to deliver messages to him that are consistent about identifying good friendships, people he can trust. What does it mean to be a role model? What does it mean to be a leader? And we have these conversations that are focused on a bigger picture of life and not the micro details of, you know, who he's texting this moment. So it's very, so single moms, I'm kind of curious about that. Does that mean, do you think in the research, um, Jeff, that the fathers aren't available? Is this something to do with the yes. lack of a father's figure? This, this is, yes, this has to do with lack of a father figure in their lives. Yes. And I'm so happy to hear that because I think we downplay a lot in society, the role of a dad, right? We make fun of men on sitcoms. We make fun of men all over. I can say a joke about my husband, but gosh forbid my husband could say a similar joke about me, right? We're just, we don't have the same sense of humor, but women, we're always, we can be known to put down men, make fun of them. I really try not to, um, cause I don't think it's funny, but that's interesting. So it's the, it's the attention of a man, a good father figure. Yes. And the results seem to be the same in a single dad home as a couple home. Wow. Fascinating. Um, as I work with couples, Jeff, I try really hard to get their attention that the best gift they give their children is not an Ivy League education. It's the foundational support of a happy home, of really a, a couple that's healthy and that works together and stays together. And I suppose we shouldn't say couples should stay together for the kids or, or should we maybe to a certain age? I'm kind of also curious about that. But how do you get their attention that the best gift they give their children is this foundation? The best thing we give even our extended family, I think, is a healthy marriage, right? Or our friends or our community. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I do think that uh, great marriages are supportive to happy families, happy children, and, uh, you know, well-adjusted adults as these children grow up. Certainly, we will repeat some of the mistakes that were modeled to us in our parents. And if you have a single parent, you know, you're unlikely to have good evidence of what works in a relationship. If you have two people who are dysfunctional together, you're unlikely to have evidence of what's supportive to you in a relationship later on. To answer the question about, you know, is it better to stick around just for the kids? My personal take on that is that only if you can represent stability, civility, you know, a happy household to them. Other than that, the answer is no. If you're going to create conflicts galore in, in a family dynamic, then there's no reason to stay together. Uh, as long as the kids have access to, on a regular basis, well-adjusted adults who can model what is, you know, success patterns in life, I think that that's the thing to really, you know, keep our eyes on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know it's strong to say, but conflict really kills, I think, kills hearts, kills minds. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, you write about this, Jeff, right? You said the accumulated stress of being around someone you don't get along with creates unintended consequences. What would you say are some of those unintended consequences? And, and is, there, is there hope for couples who have hit the wall, you know, by trying to turn their marriages around? I'm going to handle that last one first. I believe that there's always hope for any couple. It doesn't matter how far apart you are today. It doesn't matter how um, empty you might feel today. It is possible to improve the relationship, but it requires a commitment and it requires a level of persistence that you've got to be ready for. Um, to, to the other piece of that, which is that in any relationship, when you have a role model uh, who's operating at a high level and one who might be operating at a little bit of a disadvantage. Let me give you an ex a specific example of that. I walk into my house and I notice that my wife partner is upset. Maybe she's sad. Maybe she's depressed. Maybe I'm not even aware of how she is. What's the impact of that on me? 
if I come home from work and I'm stressed out of my mind because of a project that I've got a deadline on that's not going well, what's the impact of my stress on her? And most importantly, what are the impact of our individual stress on the children? In any family dynamic, when you're in close proximity to people, it's very difficult to keep stress of one person away from impacting others. You both have, I'm sure, been around people who haven't been entirely happy all the time. What's the impact of their personal unhappiness on you? To what degree are you able to interfere and elevate that level of happiness on their part? Or to what degree does it deteriorate your own sense of happiness or joy? And, and my own perspective is unless you're intentionally there to take responsibility for the environment that you want to create in your home, then you're going to end up caught up in somebody else's mood. Um, and that's not, I don't believe that that's necessarily optimal. We'll be right back after this brief message. And we're back. Well, let's dive right in. We're so sensitive to each other's moods, aren't we? When I come in in a mood or a funk, my husband, first question he'll ask me is, are you mad at me? <laughs> are you mad at me? Right? He just wants to know. He just wants to know that he's okay. He, it's okay if I'm upset with someone else or something else, but he just wants to know. And, and I don't know, is there, what do you recommend that we do or say to each other when we have come home and it's been a tough day? It's, it's not about a loved one. It's just about what happened on our side. How can you well, clear the air? There, there, there are other consequences as well, which we'll get into later on that have to do with health and the impact of even low level arguments on internal stress, cortisol levels and so on. Um, but ultimately, I, I, I can only tell you what I did personally, and I can only view it from a lens of what works, what's supportive, what's most beneficial, what's helpful uh, to improving a mood in a home. The most meaningful thing that I was able to do was I made a decision that part of my job was to help reduce my wife's stress burden. It was just part of my role as a leader in a relationship and me as a leader, I view myself as a leader. So it was part of my role to help her reduce her stress. What could I do to offset stress? If I came home and noticed she was in a particular stressed out mood, trying to scramble to prepare dinner because she was late for something, I would suggest immediately we go out to dinner or could I help her out? Um, I had lots of ideas on the spot and began to live in more of a spontaneous uh, attitude around what did she need from me in order to help relieve her stress burden. Because I thought not only was it going to impact me if I allowed it to, but certainly it was going to impact our son as well. And I didn't want to. My goal for our home was peace. We didn't. I certainly didn't always achieve it for sure, but that was my goal. So if we had a peaceful home, it was going to be happy. It was going to be fun. It was going to be playful. But if there wasn't peacefulness, then everything else was going to fall apart. Mm, that really resonates. I, I love that, Jeff. It's what does she need from me? Right there. Just asking that question alone is this outward mindset. It's not about me. It's it's about this other person, this partner, this this spouse, and yeah. And then responding. Right. It's like okay, what can and it's observing and serving, um, and just going into action. I, I think with the expectation of of nothing, right in return. It's just it's just no ulterior motive. It's what does she need from me right now? I love that. I want to say there there is an ulterior motive, and I want to uh, disclose what that is. So if my goal is peace and I'm not leading it, I'm not going to get it. And if I'm not giving to her to get peace, I'm not going to get it. So for me, it was self-serving to give constantly to you know facilitate what I wanted. But I really asked nothing back in return. I didn't care if I got anything back because I was going to get what I wanted inevitably, which was a more peaceful home. That makes sense. It wasn't about asking her to do anything or response. It was more about, this is my thing. I'm going to work to make it happen. Just like any goal that I have some level of control over. It wasn't about controlling her. It was about controlling myself to facilitate a happier outcome. That was all. 
that was the payoff for you. Right. But you, so we I really control my part better. That was, that was really yeah. it. We have different roles, do we, as men and women? Because I didn't once hear you say, Jeff or Dave, that it was um, her job to reduce your stress. You didn't look at it that way, Jeff? No, never. No. Never. Because you're a man, because you look at it differently, you have a role of being protector, provider, hero. Yeah? Maybe unconsciously some of that is true. You know, certainly most men are, you know, the condition to the, you know, be tough, don't show your emotions type of thing for sure. And, uh, but it, it was more about knowing who I was and honoring that part of myself, not really, not looking so much to her to do much of anything other than for me to be who I know myself to be. And if I was going to be that person, then I was going to help facilitate what it was that I wanted and a more peaceful outcome in her because I cared about her, of course. And so if I could help her in some way, elevate how she was feeling, I was, you know, I wanted to do that. Okay. So that role was helper. What, what is your, what's your phys- helper? Yeah, it was what, more, what? I viewed it as more of a leader role than, than leader. Any- That's what you said. Got it. The leader role. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I love that. And when all else fails, turn to hugs, right, Jeff? <laughs> sometimes that's all we need, even as women. I can speak to the woman role. Is I, sometimes I just need that long hug so I can just kind of regulate my breathing and know that all is going to be okay and let that oxytocin surge take over. Yeah, I, you said something interesting about a, a study at Ohio State. Tell us more about that. What, was, what did they determine, please? That was one of those uh, aha moments of me when I saw that study. This is a couple of decades ago. Ohio State did, a, I believe it was a multi-decade study about the impact of low-level arguments, say a normal couple argument, what they consider to be normal, that, that lasted about 30 seconds. And then it was kind of over. And they did skin scratches, and then they measured the time frame for those scratches to heal. And what they found was the immune systems of folks who argued somewhat regularly, low-level arguments, it took an extra two to three days just to heal a normal scratch. And so when they measured white blood cell counts and so on, there was an immune suppression that occurred. And so I thought, wow, that's pretty amazing stuff. And so if the environment is hostile, not only are you adding to cortisol levels, which are obviously stress hormones, um, but you're also getting elevated blood pressure. You're getting depleted white blood cell count. So the impact is even more severe in, a ha- in what I would consider to be a hostile household. And so a fascinating study. And then later on, they did a, a study around hugging, which was even kind of just as fascinating. Yeah. So the hugging, what is it? A 10 second hug, 20 second hug? What they found is that couples who were able to hug at least 10 seconds, uh, they increased boosted immune function. They lowered blood pressure, lowered cortisol, boosted serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin. Uh, they were able to uh, remedy colds and flu faster, uh, wound healing faster. And so there's all these benefits of hugging. And what they found was that, which was a kind of surprising thing for me, because um, to imagine hugging somebody for 20 seconds might seem like an eternity when you're barely getting along. But the ideal point for immune function and good feelings and overall positive elevation of the physical body and mental well-being, depression rates go down with hugs feelings of wellness kind of take over is about 20 seconds. So if you can hug somebody for 20 seconds, you're going to get kind of optimal benefits. And so my guidance to anybody out there who's listening, who is not able to hug for two or three seconds today, it's a work in progress. If you can hold on for half a second more, two seconds more, and over a period of time, maybe you can get up to 10 or 15 or 20 seconds. And then you get into that optimal space where you do have healing benefits, and most importantly, stress offsets. That's beautiful. I've heard, we've heard professionals come on our, our show talking about just trying to regulate your breathing together, right? Leaning in a bit and just to regulate. Ah, that just sounds so good. My husband's just getting over the flu. And so the last thing I wanted to do was 
hug him. You know, <laughs> maybe I should have been hugging him more before so he didn't get the flu. But anyway, it's fun. Yeah. I, I love that study. Thank you for telling us about it. Yeah, that's super powerful. I I love those. Jeff, do you have other, you know, go tos or how tos as far as uh, marriage building, strengthening the, the marriage? You believe that it's it's the small and simple partner interactions. We believe that right here at the Strong Stronger um, Marriage Connection podcast. Those small, simple, little things done, uh, as Gottman says, you know, small things often. These exchanges, these responses between couples that can create happier, healthier marriages. What, where do you have like, uh, do you have top three directives for all of us wanting to, to do just that? Well, top three and I do. I, uh, the very first thing for me that mattered was having a vision of what I wanted. And, uh, you know, as you know, we've talked a little bit about vision in the past and how important it is. If I didn't know what it was I wanted to experience with my partner, I was going to meander to whatever my mood was or her mood was in the moment. But with something that was clear and compelling to me that I could work towards every day, um, that, that was much more meaningful. And so for me, that meant a feeling. Well, how did I want to feel in her presence all the time, every time, not once in a while, not when it was good, but every day, all the time, as often as we were together, which was I wanted to feel deeply connected with her. I wanted to feel like uh, we we had this magnified experience of togetherness that didn't uh, diminish ever, no matter how long we were together, attraction for each other, high level of passion for each other with no diminishment over time. And in fact, what I found and what I experienced was that it actually elevated over time. You know, there's this old thought that, you know, your sexual passion and your excitement and eagerness for each other disappears after your first couple of years, or that's the peak. And I found that not to be true at all. Um, but it was a focus of mine and it, the things you tend to focus on tend to happen. The second thing is that I used every interaction as kind of a fresh start, a new beginning, a place to experiment, to see what I could do to elevate that feeling of togetherness or to appease what I viewed as elevated stress in her, or to even begin to connect with her or communicate about something that um, may be hidden. So each interaction has to become its own new experience. And the third thing I think is highly important is you've been together five years, you've been together 15 years, 50 years, you think you know this person inside and out. And my own thought process about that was that this is not true at all. And I would uh, try to come home intentionally. Having been with my wife for 15 years at one point, I said to myself, what can I notice about her today that's new? What can I see in her that I've never seen before? What level of awareness do I actually have about who she is? Do I really know her that well? You know, what can I do to find out more? And so this level of curiosity led me to explore more of who she was as an individual, more of what her deeper thoughts were, more of, of what her life was meant to be about from her own experience. And so it was a beautiful thing that unfolded for me over time. And I found that it was like a, a blossoming of getting to know her even uh -huh. 19 years in. Uh -huh, that's wonderful. You know, we, we talked a little bit about what's, what society now is, has coined the polyamory, right? Or some type of open marriages because there is a boredom, I suppose. And yet if couples really understood their own partner is changing over time, right? They can, that excitement can be right there, right there in the moment. We're not the same as when we met. We have different thoughts and ideas and get really curious about what those are for your partner. I think is what I hear you saying. Yes. Uh, I also want to add to that, you know, there's this, uh, we're in a narrowing attention span world and, um, we're also in an easily replaceable world where social media gives us glimpses of who we might be with, or if a conflict is high for the moment, Oh, this other person's got my attention. And, and so there's this tendency towards distraction. And so if we are distracted from our partner for any reason, it becomes easier to see grass as greener on the other side when in fact it may not be. Um, 
I, I also wanted to add that in the scheme of creating excitement, we tend to take each other for granted over time and people get into routines, even of, you know, sexual, sexual play and foreplay and things like that. We tend to get into routines and there has to be a sense of adventure in a relationship. There has to be a sense of newness, a sense of excitement about being with each other. And, and there are lots of techniques and strategies and ideas, but it does take a willingness to look at this partnership that you have with this person as something important to you. Because if it is important, you will tend it and you will nurture it. If it's not that important, then other things will interfere and you'll find other reasons not to pay it the attention that it deserves. These are just choices. Yeah. Mm. Gosh, well said. Mm -hmm. Well said, Jeff. Yeah. It feels like Jeff, let me just add a thought there because I love what you're saying. We, we, live in a day of distraction to so many things that are competing for our attention. I would say more than at any other time in, in history. And so what you're saying really resonates. I, I'm hearing um, this intentionality that you have to be very intentional. You have to be seeking and looking for uh, the good or the new or something, uh, you know, uh, that you didn't know before um, with your partner or spouse that, it, but it's because we could just, you know, just kind of drift along and we're so in this busy, busy, go, 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 that uh, if we're too busy, we won't see it. We won't notice the new and the novel. Uh, we won't make time for it. And so it's, it's slowing down um, and yeah, narrowing down into those because with all the distractions, it's really difficult to really slow down and pay attention and, and, and enjoy, right? We're talking about 10 seconds, 20 seconds with the hugs. And everyone has that, you know, no one is too busy for that. It's a, but it's really about making that a priority. Love it. It is. And it's, uh, it is in a very short time frames, you can experience a tremendous improvement in a relationship, five seconds, 10 seconds. It doesn't take any time at all to really begin to connect differently with your partner from a hat on the shoulder to a, arm around the waist to a gesture of, hey, can I help you with that? I mean, there's lots of tiny ways to make a difference every single day and to look to those. And then ideally to begin to create new experiences with each other. Sometimes it's something as simple as a new restaurant to try out or a new recipe at home to cook together or a little adventure on the road where you just jump into the car and off you go. So there's lots of ways to create this sense of newness and excitement and adventure, but it has to be with each other, not separately. I recently saw a couple of Jeff who'd been married five years and uh, it was quite sad to me because here they are at this, at this precipice, this crossroads of wondering, are we really, are we really a good fit? Should we really stay together or be, before we have kids, should we maybe think about, um, different partners before we go forward. And it made me think a bit about even this love learning curve that I had seen you write about is what, what, what could they anticipate? You know, the limerence love and does love change? I heard just a minute ago, you said, well, maybe, maybe not so much. It's not that it goes away. That excitement doesn't have to. What direction do you have, even just for me or couples like that as a therapist, but for couples who also might be at that crossroads? Do I stay? Do I go? And Am I expecting too much? Am I not giving enough? I think those are all great questions. And uh, while each situation is different, it's important that you determine how are we aligned and what has to happen in order for me to be happy with this person? What is it that I really want in my relationship? And is this the place that that's going to happen for me? There's this element of what am I getting that is pretty prevalent out there? You can't get anything if you're unwilling to give. Nothing is going to come back. And so my own experience has always been what I give comes back to me in lots of different and surprising ways. But if I'm waiting for my partner to give, I'm going to be waiting a very long time. If I'm waiting for an interaction to change or I'm waiting for a mood to change or I'm waiting for the right moment, I'm going to be waiting a long time. And so the very first thing is, are we aligned? Are we aligned on the things that are most meaningful and important to me in my life? 
And really to go through a conversation about that and to really to understand what is really meaningful to me. What is it that I want out of this relationship? And in terms of a hierarchy of that, how matched are we actually? And is there movement or compromise or agreements then that can be created about, about how we identify that alignment and how we live that together? I like that. I know that the couple were asking, are we going to regret this one day? If we say goodbye to each other, one day are we going to say, oh my gosh, maybe it was better than I realized. Huh. You know, so I think they're, they're, love does change a little bit, Jeff and Dave. You think that's fair to say that that thrilling passion that brought you together? You can't really keep your hands off each other and you can't stop thinking about each other. Do you think that changes a bit so that then we can go to work and make families and have other things that we have to attend to? Is that fair? That was my feeling is there was a misunderstanding maybe of what to expect from different stages of love. My, my answer to that is that it doesn't have to change. Um, I have strategies that I've used with, used with clients that I will mention. Porn addiction is a very big deal. It's a problem. Uh, and I saw some data recently that said, while men are 90% of porn viewership, for all men, I think it's like 90% of men have viewed porn in the last month, the data that I saw, which I find a little surprising. Uh, and that number for women in the last month is 60%. I used to have this thought process that men were the primary viewers of porn, women not so much, but that's changed dramatically. Women are now viewing porn. And so when your experience sexually is distracted from each other into these outside influences, then it's easy to imagine the excitement for each other to diminish all by itself without you doing anything other than watching porn. And we know evidentially that um, young people are having challenges because of pervasive use of porn. There's erectile dysfunction that is magnified dramatically in the youth. And uh, it takes, best I recall, it takes about six months of cold turkey from porn in, term, in terms of a, so a 20 year old can become sexually uh, active or sexually responsive. So porn is having a direct impl- impact on brains of young people, and it is problematic in maintaining attraction for your partner. So what I recommend that couples do, if they do masturbate or in fantasy thinking to think only about your partner, and to, even if you're not attracted to your partner in the moment, to recall a moment when you were attracted to your partner, to envision this in your mind. And what it tends to do is to build a soul focus on each other. This requires some um, mindfulness, of course. But once your mind operates on the soul focus of each other, you'll find that the attraction for each other becomes magnified. If, does this make sense? Absolutely. So, so all you've, those you've wiped out all the distractions and the sole focus of each other is mindfulness uh, that continues to progress and elevate the experience of wanting to be with each other with each other and the desire for being with each other. I think that's so cool. Distractions affect attractions. That's beautiful. You know, Jeff, at this part of our interview, we also love to ask our guests this one question, and that is for you. What do you think is the key? It could be something we've talked about today or something totally different to a stronger marriage connection. Commitment to, to improvement, a commitment to learning, a commitment to growing in the relationship itself, and uh, a willingness to self-reflect on your role in any unhappiness in any particular moment. Mm. Mm-hmm. Thank you. If I agree. Yeah. Love it, Jeff. Hey, where can listeners go uh, to find out more about you and your, your online practice? They can go to the number 90, 90 minute marriage miracle.com. Uh, and you can check me out there. Okay. Yeah. And we'll put that in the, the show notes uh, as well. Hey, we'd like to wrap things up here um, by asking about your, your takeaway of the day. Is there a take home message that you hope our listeners will remember? What's your takeaway from today, Jeff? I hope listeners remember that every 
interaction with each other is a chance for a fresh start, is a chance to improve things between you, is a chance to deepen connection, is a chance to reconnect, to resolve conflicts, a chance to apologize. Every single interaction can be utilized to improve your relationship. Mm. I love that. I love that idea about every interaction. You just have to view it differently with intentionality. Liz, what about you? What's your takeaway today? Yeah, it is just those small things, isn't it? I, I love that too, Jeff and Dave. You know what? I, I'm really drawn to this whole idea about distractions affecting attractions. Even uh, Jeff, as you were so kind to talk about, you know, after the passing of your wife and then trying to date again and how that distraction was really a kind of hurtful to your son. And I, I wish more parents would would pause and understand that who are either divorced or uh, who are also widows, widowers, to understand that, well, maybe there is a time and a place. And the most, most important thing right now is the well-being of that child. So I have such uh, respect for you and your devotion to him. That's my greatest takeaway. Uh, Dave, what about you, about our time to, to, together with Jeff Fort? Yeah, this has been great, Jeff. We sure appreciate you coming um, back on and, and sharing so many um, awesome insights. I think that one is, I'm going to come back to the one earlier. Uh, I love what you said, and I don't know if I'll get be able to get it right, but if I, you know, what does she or he, what does my partner need from me right now, right now in this moment? What can I do to relieve that, that whether it's a stress or burden, can I help out in the kitchen? Can I make, you know, clean things up or get dinner, whatever it is in the moment think, what do they need from me um, right now in this, in this moment or in this interaction? So I appreciate that insight. That's, that's going to uh, stick with me. So thank you. Thanks again, Jeff, for coming on uh, round two for us. Listeners, if you have not heard Jeff on, on round one, you got to go back to one of our beginning episodes. We brought Jeff on and he, he knocks it out of the park. So we brought him back again. So Jeff, thanks so much for joining us again. It was great. Very happy, happy to be here. Yep, your dear colleague, Jeff. Thank you. That's it. Our friends for another episode of Stronger Marriage Connection. We'll see you next time. And do remember, it's the small things that create a stronger marriage connection. Take care now. We'll see you. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, do us a favor and take a few minutes to subscribe to our podcast and the Utah Marriage Commission YouTube channel, where you can watch this and every episode of the show. When you hit the like button and leave a comment, your feedback helps us improve the show. And don't forget to share this episode with a friend. You can also follow and connect with us on Instagram at Stronger Marriage Life and on Facebook at Stronger Marriage. Be sure to share with us what topics you want us to explore or what you loved about today's episode. If you want even more resources to improve your relationship connection, visit our website at StrongerMarriage.org where you'll find free workshops, webinars, relationship surveys, and more. Each episode of Stronger Marriage Connection is hosted and sponsored by the Utah Marriage Commission at Utah State University. And finally, a big thanks to our producers, Rex Polanis and Alexis Alcott, and the team at Utah State University. And you, our audience, you make this show possible.